He had over 5,000 people in the palm of his hand. They followed him. They wanted to be taught by him. Poof. Think about it if it were to happen today. So some, somebody does these miraculous things and your interest is piqued and, and, you, and you follow him. And, and then he says, you know, I, I am the way. I am the way to the divine. And you turn to each other. Isn't that Joe and Mary's kid? And you'd be halfway out the door. And then he says, and you need to eat of my flesh. And then we say, okay, I know where the tour is. I'll let myself out. And then we go home, we tell our parents. And their first question would be, did you give him any money? <laughs> and we say, no. And they go, oh, dodge that bullet. Don't be too hard on the crowd. As Jesus says, people come to Jesus through God's bidding. The Spirit's call would come later at Pentecost and beyond. This crazy talk about needing to eat the flesh. Some people believe that it was a later addition, that John didn't write it, but the early church did, who were accustomed to celebrating communion. And that would not have thrown them off at all. Others believe that you know, John was not that worried about the accurate, an accurate historical account, but is crafting a narrative that shows the identity of Christ, the cluelessness of the disciples, and the eventual rejection of the people, which we know is going to happen from the very beginning of the gospel. John 1 verse 11, he came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. The language here is, rep is, is reminiscent of that early poetry. In the beginning was the word and the word became flesh. And this language of word and flesh and abiding in Christ is woven throughout the gospel of John. Verse 56, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I abide in them, which makes us think of John 14 and 15, a uh, crowd favorite today of abiding in Christ and clinging to the vine that is Christ. In our scripture passage from today, Jesus has successfully run off the multitude and then turns to the 12. Do you want to go too? And Peter answers, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe that you are the Holy One of God. And written between the lines, even though we have no clue what you're talking about. And by the way, Peter is just repeating back to Jesus what Jesus has already said. In verse 63, Jesus says, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Verse 68, Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Verse 63, Jesus said, among you are those who do not believe. Verse 68, Peter says, we have come to believe and know that you are the living one, the Holy One of God. This might be a good time to talk about faith that allows room for doubt, that we don't have to understand it all in order to be a follower of Christ. Earlier we read when many of the disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware of the disciples, aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Now I'm a word geek. And I love the fact that I can, I can look up in Greek the, the words to see how the, 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 the choices that the translators made. It could read, this word is difficult. Who can understand it? Who can comprehend it? The literal translation is a play on words. Having heard him, they questioned, who can hear him? Who can comprehend him? Who can understand him? And the word for complaining is an onomatopoeia like the, the sound of doves cooing, uh, or it could be translated murmuring, grumbling, whispering, you know, that if you can roll your eyes, you can make a sound <laughs> of doves cooing, right? Um, and I, I picture a, a classroom full of students where the teacher says something and the kids, you know, are embarrassed to raise their hand and ask what, what the teacher's talking about. So they turn to each other like, what is he talking about? Did we read this? Was it in the homework? You know, help. But G, the, the translators choose the word complaining. And my guess is because of Jesus' response. Jesus says, does this offend you? 
which could also be translated, does this scandalize you? Does this make you stumble or fall away? Are there teachings of Christ that scandalize you, cause you to stumble, fall away? And at the very least, squirm. Uh, I have to say in Spanish first. Uh, Monsignor Oscar Romero de El Salvador, Monsignor Oscar Romero from El Salvador, uh, wrote this in The Violence of Love. And I have this on my door as a, in my office as a reminder. A church that doesn't provoke any crisis, a gospel that doesn't unsettle, a word of God that doesn't get under anyone's skin, a word of God that doesn't touch the real sin of the society in which it is being proclaimed. What gospel is that? Very, this is, this is the word to, to congregations. Very nice, pious considerations that don't bother anyone. That's the way many would like preaching to be. And this is the word for preachers. Those preachers who avoid, who avoid every thorny matter so as not to be harassed, so as not to have conflicts and difficulties, do not light up the world that they live in. Unquote. The gospel of Christ unsettles. In I, the devotional that I read dur during this week, uh, August 17th to be exact, uh, I read that Ignatius of Lyon said in the second century, Christianity is not, a is not a matter of persuasive words. It is a matter of true greatness as long as it is hated by the world. The gospel of Christ, Christianity, is meant to be countercultural. And then in the fourth century, Christianity became the official religion of the, of the Roman Empire, which makes it really difficult to be the critics of, of how things are in the world. You, the lines blur, the lines cross between uh, the, the gospel critiquing the larger culture and then the gospel endorsing the edicts of the Roman Empire. Some have wondered whether the church's ability to critique larger culture was sabotage way back then with Constantine. It's, un it's something to think about. Another way to ask this is, how has Christianity conformed the gospel to the ways of the world? Everybody loves that question. Uh, you know, amen, yes, yeah, say it again so the people in the back can hear. How, is Christ how has Christianity conformed the gospel to the ways of the world? It's a great question to ask ourselves all the time. How are we compromising the gospel? But I guarantee, I guarantee we will have different understandings. We will have different under, uh, responses to that question. Some of you will want to focus on personal piety. Other will want to focus on Christian nas uh, nationalism and corporate sin. But these are all good questions that we need to be asking ourselves. And we shouldn't be afraid to ask them. Because otherwise, how can we reform ourselves? In our tradition, we, we say with pride, we are reformed and always reforming. But let's jump back to the clueless disciples and the crowd that abandoned Jesus. The disciples would soon do the same, except for the, the women and the, and the beloved disciple. But when Jesus is resurrected and Pentecost comes, the, the disciples would be empowered to minister to the crowd that had already deserted him, that had already written him off. I had a conversation with a colleague this week, somebody I went to a seminary with, a good friend, and she had gone to a webinar and the, the faith leader who's, who was leading it uh, from an evangelical background talking about evangelism said, we've got our work cut out for us. He says, at, at this point, we need to assume that everybody who's not in, in the church has either had a bad experience with the church or knows of someone who did. That's our playing field. That's our mission field. How do we share our faith with the people who have already decided? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. And I would like to, to note that, that folks don't think that Jesus is nonsense just the church and Christians. Being church in the 21st century is not easy, but 
but what can we do, right? As people of faith, we are the church, like the disciples. You know, we're confused. We don't have the answers, but how do we proceed? Do we throw our hands up complaining about how hard it is? Where, where would we go? To Jesus, of course, for he has the words of life. And I don't know if you noticed, but Jesus said something that Peter omitted. Jesus said, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Spirit, the spirit of God, which is good news. Because we don't have it all together. We don't have all the answers. But we would give our lives so that other people might know that faith in Jesus Christ makes a difference. It makes all the difference. And with the Spirit's help, we can make that known. It's our job to love on the crowd and recognize that sometimes we're in it. You know, sometimes we are the faithful, rem- the, the faithful remnant and other times we desert God. And sometimes we think we're faithful when we're not. And that's when we remember that we're never pointing to ourselves. We're always pointing to God. That's the only way I can do this. Because this is not about me. It's always about pointing to God. And our job is not to get, uh, sometimes churches lose focus. They vote, you know, our job is not to get people into the pews. Our job is to introduce people to a relationship with God so that they might know life. Your job, my job, is to witness to our experience of God made known in Jesus Christ. That's it. Not to have all the answers, not to have it all together, not to make convincing arguments, simply to confess, I follow Jesus. I have come to believe that he is the Holy One of God. He is word, he is life, he is God with us. God can work with that and has for thousands of years. It has never been easy. And that's how the power of God is made manifest in the world, through our weakness and faithful cluelessness. To God be the glory. Amen.